five-month-old Benjamin hadn't been fed in four days. His diaper hadn't been changed in five. The last time he was given a bath had been more than a week prior. When officers responded to a 911 call about a baby who was not breathing, they arrived within five minutes, but it was too late to save him. This is Monsters. It was 2.54 p.m. on February 12, 2008, when a 911 call was made in central Illinois. The caller was distressed, making it clear that they needed urgent help for a baby boy who had stopped breathing. Emergency responders knew that the well-being of a child was at stake, so the first car was sent immediately to the scene on Proctor Street in Peoria County. The paramedics arrived at 2.59. After both the fire department and paramedics arrived on scene, police officers from the local station were also dispatched because one of the paramedics had let the station know that they believed it might have been a case of shaken baby syndrome. Immediately after walking through the door, one thing was painfully obvious to the officers. The house had a terrible, putrid smell, made even worse by the fact that the inside of the house was kept at a very warm 78 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. The officers walked inside to find James Sargent, the father of the baby, wrapped in a blanket on the living room couch. He was curled up in the fetal position, hugging his knees to his chest, and he was sobbing. The officers moved past James and toward one of the bedrooms, struggling to walk because of the random debris and rubbish that covered the floor. A medic, who had been on the scene for less than 20 minutes, warned the officers that the baby was inside the room, but he was already dead. They had already notified a police sergeant over the phone, informing them that the child had been dead for some time. When the officers entered the baby's bedroom, it became clear why no efforts were being taken to revive him. On the wall above the crib, there was a carved wooden decoration spelling out the name Benjamin. Underneath it, in the crib, was the body of baby Benjamin. Despite being inside a crib, he was fully dressed in a snowsuit that covered almost his entire body, and someone had strapped him tightly into a child's car seat. Benjamin's eyes were open, and he was so dehydrated that his eye sockets had a sunken appearance. At some point, tears, mucus, and saliva had been leaking out of his eyes and mouth, but so much time had passed since his death that the foam had dried into a crust on his pale skin. Underneath the car seat, detectives could see a pool of urine that had leaked from Benjamin's snowsuit and into the mattress of the crib. It was clear to all of the first responders on the scene that Benjamin was past saving. He'd been dead for at least a day, possibly even longer. Rigor mortis had already set in, leaving Benjamin frozen in a position with his left hand up in the air and his little fingers squeezed into a fist. Later, police would find out that Benjamin had been starving. In fact, he hadn't been given any formula for at least four days. This made one of the details of the crime scene much crueler. Next to Benjamin in the car seat lay a half-empty bottle of baby formula. He was too young to pick up the bottle and feed himself, but the people who were supposed to be caring for him never took the time to do it. After photographs were taken of Benjamin's body and surroundings, a county coroner arrived at the crime scene to take custody of Benjamin's body. She also removed the car seat, the half-empty baby bottle, and the clothing he was wearing from the scene. While removing Benjamin from the house, no signs of trauma were clearly visible, however the coroner decided against removing Benjamin's snowsuit at the crime scene, so most of his body remained covered. Investigators moved on to taking photos of the rest of the house. They had to turn the thermostat down to try to control the smell, which only helped slightly. 
although the rush to try to save Benjamin, and then deal with the horror of the state they had found the deceased baby in, had been their main focus. It was impossible not to notice the state of disarray that the Proctor Street house was in. Multiple detectives who attended the scene described it as, quote-unquote, filthy. The sink was piled high with dirty dishes, and pieces of garbage were scattered around the kitchen and living room. There were signs that somebody had been living in the house's garage. Multiple doors had been damaged. It was a completely unsuitable environment for raising a child, and the contents of the refrigerator and kitchen cupboards made that even more clear. Detectives searched the house for any signs that Benjamin had been taken care of. There were very few baby food items to be found. As well as the bottle that had been next to his body, there were two empty cans of baby formula, one jar of banana baby food, and a half-empty box of baby cereal. It wasn't enough to feed a five-month-old for the rest of the day, let alone any longer period of time. One of the officers went to speak to James Sargent, who was still on the couch, rocking back and forth, muttering under his breath and crying. He asked how Benjamin was doing and was informed that his son was dead. James responded that he had fed Benjamin earlier that day and thought he was okay. Every single first responder on the scene was aware that he was lying. Investigators had another priority, trying to locate Benjamin's mother, Tracy Herman. James told them that he didn't know where Tracy was because she had left the house the previous night to stay with an acquaintance. Before investigators could ask any other questions, James received a call on his cell phone. It was Tracy. He excused himself to talk to her in another room and at one point was overheard telling Tracy, quote, I haven't said anything to them, although it wasn't clear what he was talking about. One of the officers told James that they needed to speak with Tracy, and James passed over the phone. Tracy asked if anything was wrong with Benjamin, but investigators didn't want to reveal any details over the phone, asking her to return to the house so they could speak to her in person. Tracy initially said that she wouldn't be able to come home for several hours because she had left her car in a different location and had been unable to drive it due to the weather. The officer insisted that it was important they speak to her as soon as possible and suggested that another officer would be able to give Tracy a ride back to the Proctor Street house. Tracy deflected the offer by saying that she didn't know what address she was at. Sure. With no other options, investigators backed down and agreed that they would see Tracy when she returned home in three hours' time. After the call ended, James seemed to become self-conscious for a moment and apologized to the officers for the filthy state of his home, telling them, quote, I've been so busy with Benjamin that I haven't had time to clean. It was as if he had no idea that everybody in the room had seen the state of his son's body and knew that he hadn't cared for the baby in days. James then asked what had happened to Benjamin. One of the officers responded by saying, quote, I don't know, but you should be able to tell me yourself. They sat down on the couch together, and the officer noticed that James had several cuts on his left arm that had possibly been self-inflicted. James was asked to come to the police station for more in-depth questioning, which he quietly agreed to. James arrived at the Peoria police station at around 3.45 p.m., at the time of the first interview he had with the police, investigators were still wondering if Benjamin's death had been a case of shaken baby syndrome, which would mean that it was murder instead of neglect. Part of the motive behind questioning James was to figure out if he had shaken or physically harmed Benjamin, then panicked and called the police to cover his tracks. After Tracy finally returned to the scene, she was also brought into the station for questioning. Tracy confirmed James's version of events, telling detectives that she had been away from the house the previous evening after she and James had gotten into an argument. She painted a hugely dysfunctional picture of her relationship with Benjamin's father. Frequent fighting, James being prone to lashing out in episodes of anger, and his refusal to clean the house or take care of Benjamin. According to Tracy, Benjamin had still been alive when she left the house the previous evening. Although detectives were sure that Benjamin had been confined to the car seat for a very long period of time, Tracy informed them that she believed he had napped in it for a shorter period of time, only about three hours. 
When she was asked if she had changed Benjamin's diaper or clothes before leaving, Tracy responded that she didn't think Benjamin's diaper had been dirty. Just like James, Tracy insisted that she had recently fed Benjamin. She gave detectives a possible explanation for the half-empty bottle that was found in the crib next to him, telling them that before she had left the house, she filled the bottle for him and propped it up using a folded blanket so he could drink. Detectives asked if she was sure that Benjamin actually drank from the bottle, and Tracy responded that she knew he had grabbed it, but he didn't turn his head for her to see him drinking. The detectives, trying to catch Tracy in a lie, asked her about what type of formula she typically fed to Benjamin. She responded that both she and James fed Benjamin with Similac, a type of iron-fortified baby formula, but investigators had already searched the house for baby formula and knew that there was no Similac in the house at the time. A detective asked Tracy if she had noticed any signs that Benjamin was unwell the last time she saw him. She thought for a moment and then responded that she might have noticed his throat sounded raspy the previous night. However, the rasp had vanished the next day, so she didn't think it was anything serious. The questions kept coming. It was unusual for a baby to still be strapped into a car seat while in his crib. Did Benjamin usually spend a lot of time in his car seat? Yes, he did. Did anybody ever take him out of the car seat and hold him or play with him? Sometimes, but not very often. When was the last time she had changed Benjamin's diaper? Months ago. Who usually changed it? James had taken over diaper changing duties months ago, and usually, when Tracy got home from work, she would leave James to take care of Benjamin and would go straight to bed. What the investigators learned was that Tracy basically did nothing to take care of her infant son and left that all to James, who she had also complained didn't take care of the baby. Seems like there was a gaping hole in that method of child care. Then, the detective asked if Benjamin was fed and changed on some kind of normal schedule. At around this point in the interrogation, it seemed as if Tracy started to break. She told investigators that she didn't think Benjamin had a schedule, but admitted that she didn't spend enough time in the Proctor Street house to know for sure. From what she could remember, he would usually sleep through the night, from 9pm until 8am. That was a very unusual schedule for a five-month-old baby to follow. It was practically impossible. So, who got up and took care of Benjamin if he woke up during the night? Tracy answered that she believed James did, but she didn't know for sure. According to Tracy, Benjamin didn't cry much. Usually, he only cried when he was hungry. Throughout the interrogation, Tracy continued to insist that Benjamin had been completely healthy when she left the house the previous night. She revealed that, in the past, she'd made an effort to keep track of how much he was eating, but recently, she'd been too busy with work to be able to keep up with it. Several times, she repeated, quote, All I ever do is work. She told investigators that she had always been aware that the filthy house wasn't the right environment to raise Benjamin in, to the point where she had considered putting him up for adoption. But none of her family members had been willing to take him in. And with her being so busy at work, she hadn't had the time to make any further arrangements. From what Tracy revealed in her interview, it seemed as if her relationship with James was incredibly rocky. She described James as doing nothing except for playing video games and eating all of the food in the house, refusing to do chores or help take care of Benjamin. Again, she said that while also saying he was the baby's primary caretaker, not seeming to see the problem with that. In her point of view, the condition of the house had never been great, but it had gotten worse and worse over the past few months. Despite James being irresponsible and unclean, Tracy said repeatedly that she had never observed James being cruel or physically abusive to Benjamin. When she was asked if she believed that Benjamin was neglected, she replied that yes, she did believe that. However, when she was asked if she believed Benjamin had been abused, she replied no. In Tracy's interviews, one of the things she repeatedly mentioned was her job at the restaurant TGI Fridays, and how she was so busy with work. Two detectives went to Tracy's workplace to speak to the manager, who told them that Tracy had worked there as a hostess for around a year and a half. 
Checking Tracy's work record for the night of Benjamin's death backed up what she had initially told police. She had called in and let her boss know that her car had been iced in and she wouldn't be able to work her shift. Despite Tracy's long-term employment at TGI Fridays, her manager disagreed with her statements that she was always at work. She'd never worked more than 40 hours per week in the entire time she'd been there. Usually, she only worked around 30 hours in a week, giving her plenty of time to care for Benjamin. In fact, the amount that Tracy worked had recently decreased. She'd become more and more unreliable over the past two or three months, calling in sick or showing up late. It had gotten so bad that they were considering firing her. Benjamin's autopsy was carried out by Dr. Scott Denton on February 14, 2008, two days after his body was discovered. He was 24 inches long and weighed only 10 pounds. His body showed no clear signs that he had been physically abused. His skin was unmarked and there were no fractures to his bones. Although it was clear to Dr. Denton from the examination that Benjamin had been severely neglected, he wasn't able to immediately make a conclusion about the cause of the baby's death. Investigators met with Benjamin's pediatrician, Dr. Gene Harris. They told Dr. Harris that at his time of death, Benjamin had weighed only 10 pounds. At his birth, he had weighed 8 pounds, which was an average weight for a newborn baby. Normally, babies continually put on weight each month after their birth, steadily tracking upwards. Benjamin had no known health issues that would explain his drastic weight loss or failure to gain weight. Dr. Harris was visibly shocked by the information, saying, quote, There is something seriously wrong. Something bad happened. She showed investigators a chart with a reference range for infant weights, showing investigators that, by six months, Benjamin should have weighed at least 17 pounds. Dr. Harris was right. Something had gone seriously wrong. But it hadn't been a sudden event. It had been a slow landslide of worsening neglect that eventually took Benjamin's life. When Benjamin's cause of death was officially determined, it was gut-wrenching news. Benjamin had been dropped off at James and Tracy's house on February 4th, strapped safely into his car seat. It was very likely that he had not been removed from the car seat at all during the following eight days, and he died trapped in the same position, unable to free himself. Because his diaper was left soiled for so long, bacteria and infection had eaten away at the skin and soft tissue around his genitals, upper thighs, and lower belly. His body wasn't able to fight off the infection. He was weak from starvation and dehydration and sealed inside a warm snowsuit in a house where the thermostat was running high. In the car seat, he couldn't even roll over to take the pressure off of the infected areas. His cause of death, without argument, had been neglect. It didn't matter that his parents didn't seem to have beaten or shaken him. They had killed him all the same. In the time leading up to their trials, both Tracy and James were held without bond. For their willful neglect of Benjamin, both parents faced a severe sentence, charges of first-degree murder. Tracy's other daughter, who was older than Benjamin, had been removed from her care for her own safety. Tracy chose not to risk a trial. In interviews and interrogations, she'd always seemed a little more remorseful or ashamed of her actions than James. She had made the decision that she would plead guilty to first-degree murder so that Benjamin, who had lived a short and neglected life, could have at least a little bit of justice. At the hearing, Tracy faced a small number of onlookers and gave a verbal apology. She described the decisions she had made, leading to Benjamin's death as being, quote-unquote, a mistake. Tracy Herman was sentenced to 50 years in prison, of which she's required to serve 100%. If she's ever freed from incarceration, she'll be in her 70s. The evidence and testimonies made it very clear that James Sargent had been the primary caregiver for Benjamin, and therefore, the seriousness of the neglect was attributed more to him than it was to Tracy. Whether it was reasonable or not, Tracy had delegated the duties of changing and feeding the baby to James, and he had failed to uphold his end of the bargain. During the time that Benjamin had been trapped in a car seat without food or help, James had been in the house, eating, playing video games, drinking, and bathing. He'd deprived Benjamin of these very same things, knowing that he was the only one around to care for him. 
Peoria County State Attorney Kevin Lyons described Benjamin's life and death as, quote, the worst case of child neglect we've seen since the turn of this century. Despite the court acknowledging that James had mental health issues, including a dissociation disorder where he pretended that he was a character in The Lord of the Rings, he received the maximum possible sentence that the court could give him. Found guilty of murder in the first degree, he was sentenced to 100 years behind bars. If Benjamin had somehow survived his childhood, he would be a teenager today, attending school, making friends, and becoming his own person, despite the fact that he was raised by two negligent parents who were barely out of their teenage years themselves. Instead, his life was short and there was no happy ending. At least, like his mother Tracy said, the fact that both of his parents will spend the rest of their lives behind bars gives baby Benjamin a small amount of justice. Instead of justice, though, it would have been nice if his monster parents would have treated him like a human instead of a hindrance. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. This website is set up so that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught seeking help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility. Call 911 or call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline by simply dialing 988 in the United States. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you may be facing. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community and suffering from discrimination, depression, or are in need of any support, please contact the LGBT National Hotline at 1-888-843-4564 or go to lgbthotline.org. Thanks so much for letting me tell you this story. If you enjoyed it, subscribe on whatever platform you're on, hit like, rate us, or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.